Father, thank you for the joy, the gladness, the, the celebration that we can have because you've historically won the war, defeated death. Uh, you trampled Satan's sin, hell, and the grave that morning when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so we gather in light of that reality. Uh, Father, we look forward to that day when you'll say the word and Jesus, you'll come back and make all things new. Until that day, I've got a lot of growing to do. I've got a lot in me that needs to be changed. And so thank you for not giving up on me. Um, Thank you um, that you've promised that that work you started, you'll complete it until the day that Jesus comes back. And so this morning as we open up your, your word, we believe it's truth. We believe it's powerful. And we believe it is a lamp into our feet a light into our path. And so I ask that you, through your spirit, would you use your word in my life, in our lives, to help us grow, help us mature. Father, would you help us take those seemingly small steps in obedience towards you today? I can't take the smallest step without you strengthening me for that. And so I pray this morning would be a morning of sanctification for some, for, of salvation for others. But Father, would you use this time for your glory? I confess that I've got nothing to offer to feed your children. And so unless you show up and use your word to encourage and equip and strengthen your body, it won't happen. So I pray you'd fill me with your spirit to, f- to feed and care for your sheep, for your glory, that we might look more like your son. It's in his name I pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Lewis. Well done. And welcome to Hillside. Uh, met quite a few guests, visitors, first timers, newcomers. We are delighted, absolutely delighted that you're here. Hillside is a simple, very simple place. Uh, we believe Jesus changes everything. When you read through the whole Bible, 782,815 words, there's one central figure that emerges, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so at Hillside, we love to say Jesus changes everything. He has historically changed everything. He is currently changing everything. You're not going to see it on the news, but he is. He's changing everything. He's at work and eternally He is coming back to make all things new. And so I'm going to do everything in my power this morning to preach one central message to you. It's called the gospel, that Christ Jesus was crucified in your place for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. And today, if you would place your faith in him, he'll begin writing a new story with your life because he changes everything. This isn't, again, it's not theoretical or hypothetical to me. Um, Jesus is changing me. He has changed me. My name is Dave. I'm a new creature in Christ. I have new life in Christ. And by the grace that God has given me, I'm, I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic that he's given 20 years of sobriety to. And Jesus has changed me. And that gives me confidence. If there's hope for me, a meth head out of the woods, there's hope for anybody, amen? Jesus can th- therefore change anybody. And I'm convinced He uses the weakest among us as an example to say, hey, if he can change me, uh, there's hope for you. And today we're going to look at how he changes us. Change change is a profoundly complex, difficult thing, is it not? Maturity is a profoundly difficult and complex thing. You see, we resist change because change equals loss. Something is lost in change. Change. Loss equals pain, so change equals pain, so we resist change. But if Jesus changes everything and we're resisting change, we're actually resisting Jesus, the one who's changing everything. So let's jump in for you long timers. We've been looking at how Jesus changes everything. He's actually doing it through this thing called the church. Ephesians uses the plural. It uses y'all a lot. So it's talking about us. In America, we tend to to think of you as an individual. So we come to church, what does Jesus have for me? How does Jesus want to change me? How does Jesus want to grow me? It's all about me because I'm now the center of the universe. It is about what I think, I feel, and I believe. That's postmodernism. That's secular humanism. I am at the center of all things. And we draw that into Christianity. And therefore, we read the Bible like it's just all about us individually. 
Actually, Jesus is changing everything through this group, this body where every cell works together. It's called the church. And you play a a role in that. So let's see how Jesus is changing everything. Open up to Ephesians. Beautiful passage, somewhat complex, but we're gonna walk through it and enjoy it together. And if you've ever ridden a bike, anybody here ever ridden a bike? Okay, you're totally, anybody here never rode a bike and need me to teach you how? I watched how on YouTube, I'm really good at it. I've taught three of my four kids. Didn't go all that well, but I can teach you. If you know how to ride a bike, you're gonna actually understand how change happens. There's two pedals and one principle. The principle is a mystery. Paul's going to show us the two pedals and the principle of physics that takes over that's going to make sense of why you've struggled with change your whole life. Watch this. God says, Paul writes this in chapter 4, verse 17, and we'll read down through verse 32. God says, Paul writes, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you, y'all, walk no longer... just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But y'all did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed y'all have heard him and have been taught in him just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old man or the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and, and put on the new man, the new self, which in the likeness of God has been has been created in righteousness and and of holiness uh, of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no rotten or unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment so that, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of, of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. So this is God's word that we're gonna enjoy this morning. Uh, some long sentences and huge ideas in there. So let me give you a a big theological picture so that as we walk through these verses, you can have some some hooks, some shelves to put your ideas on. Now, if you read straight through the Bible, this is gonna be a big point and it's it's gonna trigger some of you. It it goes against secular humanism and postmodernism. But if you read straight through the Bible, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, one of the big character attributes of God that you're gonna find out is because God is perfect, holy, and mature, God is unchanging. He never changes. He doesn't have to change. He's already arrived. He's perfect. Because of that truth, he himself, in himself, by himself, for himself, through himself, he gets to be the active agent changing everything around him. Because he's perfect, he doesn't have to change. Now here's the small theological picture from Genesis 3, clear on to Revelation 22. Because of sin's entrance into the world, sin always masquerades or acts like it's God. This is what Satan does. He play acts like like he's God. Therefore, sin is and seeks to be unchanging because it wants to be like God. Therefore, when sin takes us over, and you'll notice this, sin will tell you, you're just fine. You don't need to change. You know, you know who needs to change? Everybody else, because they're all idiots. If they understood reality, they would affirm me in who I am. Everybody else needs to change. In our sin, we will seek to change 
everyone else, and we'll even change God. We create God in our own image. Sin is insanity. It's an act of suicide against yourself. Now, this book also tells us the good news. It's called the gospel, that the unchanging one humbled himself, emptied himself, took the form of humanity. He joined us as a servant and a slave. The unchanging one changed. It sounds heretical. The eternal son of God took on humanity and dwelt with us so that he might set us free and we might change and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're gonna see that number one, change is super complex. I want you to understand how complex and difficult maturity and change is. Do you understand it? It's not an easy thing. To change, we have to change how we think, our mind. Have you ever tried to change somebody's political party? How's that working out for you? See, certain thoughts and ideas are neurologically rooted. There's neuropathways. We believe what we believe. We don't change easily how we think. But to change, you literally have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you've got to change how you feel. Well, in postmodern, I'm not in control of how I feel. That's what we say. I just, feelings are feelings. They come and go. Well, the Bible actually says, let not your heart be troubled. So apparently I can tell my heart, stop it. You ever do that? I have to do that all the time. I have to do that before I get up here because my blood pressure goes up, my heart rate goes up, which tells me I'm having anxiety and panic, which tells me I'm making this about me. My heart's being troubled. Dave, you're going to fail. And I have to say, stop it. Stop it. It doesn't matter if I fail. Jesus has already won. I'm secure in Christ. I get to have fun telling people about Jesus. So apparently we can control our emotions. <sighs> then we not only have, does Jesus have to help change my thinking and my feeling, then my entire soulishness, my belief system has to change because out of my thinking, feeling, and believing, my behaviors flow. Change is super duper complex. But here's the most wonderful message about this book. Last time I read through it. Do you know because you have the power, in Christ you have the power of the almighty God inside of you, you can change? I took way, 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 way too much psychology in college. 101, 102, 103, 201, 202, 203, 301, 302, 303, abnormal psychology, infant psychology, child psychology. Why? Because I was broken and messed up and I was like, what's wrong with me? And I thought by study and I could understand why I was so broken. Anybody else? Okay, only one of us. Good. Well, do you know I could take the next 14 to 28 hours walking through the theories in psychology of how human change transpires. We could look at the Freudian theory of the id, ego, and superego, where the id is, there the ego shall be. We could look at Jung and his theories on motivation. We could look at cognitive behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, social behavior, cognitive therapy. We could spend, and psychology doesn't agree on how change happens. But like, we, we just don't understand. In fact, there's a whole theory in psychology, you can't change. You're just broken and so deal with it. The most amazing truth in this book is because of the gospel, I can change and I can't tell you what great news that is. I can't plumb the depths of that. You understand if you got into my medical file, you would see that I'm a, they've labeled me chronic relapser. So 20 years ago, I couldn't get insurance because I could not figure out how to live sober. And even the counseling world said, you're hopeless. Do you understand the hope that the gospel gives when you've been told you're just gonna die in your addiction? There is no hope for you. You're, you're mentally ill and we can't help you. And then you come and hear, no, actually... God can come dwell inside of you through Christ and he can change everything. I share that with you to encourage you. I don't care what you're struggling with. Paul's gonna walk through how deep, meaningful, lasting change takes place. He's gonna look at, and he's gonna ask a question about your identity. He's gonna ask, what have you snuck through customs? 
And we'll look at that. And then he's going to look at how change actually takes place in relationship, interpersonally, personally. And then he's going to look at how our character grows and builds and changes. So let's jump in. Let's have fun. Look at what, what we snuck through customs. Look at, I'm going to go 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And I want you to look at the pronouns he uses because he's going to talk about they, them, theirs, and themselves. That's those people, and he's going to talk about y'all, the body of Christ. So he's going to use the pronouns to say, here's how you used to walk, here's how they still walk, but here's how y'all now walk in Christ. Watch the pronouns. I'm going to help you enjoy them. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, so Jesus and Paul are in complete agreement on this, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of, that's ah, early, there's still coffee out there. I'm going to need your help. I don't feel good this morning either. All right? It happens sometimes. I'm going to read this bottom line, and I'm going to leave a blank so you can help fill it in. Gentiles also walk in the futility of... Okay. Go 18. Being darkened in... Oh, good. It's them. There. Outside. Excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in... Good. Because of the hardness of, he's going to do it six, six times. He's literally drawing a picture and saying, remember the kingdom you came out of, but your identity is not found there. You're not like them. Watch 19. And having become callous, have given over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So, the Gentiles, and this is so funny because guess who Paul's walking to when he says, don't walk like the Gentiles? Guess who the letter's to? Gentiles. That's funny. He's like, it, no, it's funny. He's saying, don't, listen, don't be like yourselves. I, I, it would, honestly, it would be like him writing and saying, listen, Texans, I know you're Texans. I know you remember the Alamo. I know that you've got gates on your subdivisions and gates on your house and gates before you go into your house. You've got three gates and nobody can get in to see you. Um, you've got your own way of doing life, but don't walk like Texans. How would you feel about that, hmm? Oh, no, nah, nah, I don't like that. Yeah, that's how the Gentiles are feeling. They're like, he just told us not to be us. But he says... You were brought out of the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1. He transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son. So he says, don't act like them. You've got a new identity. Watch 20. But, okay, I'm going to do it again. It's the second word in the sentence right after the contrasting conjunction. But, and that's y'all in the Greek, but y'all is plural. You didn't learn Christ that way in the hardness of heart, being depraved and sensuality. That's not how y'all learned Christ. Verse 21, if indeed y'all have heard about him and have seen and been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. Two kingdoms, different kingdoms, different customs. When you enter a new kingdom, even now, we still call it customs, do we not? How many of you have ever gone to a different country and went through customs? How many of you actually, you've snuck in, you've snuck in, sneaked, snuck, snook? How do you conjugate that verb? <laughs> snuck? Good. English teacher to help me. How many of you snuck some, at any point in time in your life, have you snuck something through customs? Anybody? Even, how many of you did it accidentally though? It was just an act, it's like, I didn't know. Did not know. Okay, now people are looking like, oh my goodness, it's not felonious, it's, that's in another nation. Now let's even the playing field. How many of you have ever snuck something into the movie theater? Okay, there's the leveler, right? Naughty, naughty, naughty. Everyone's naughty now. We're all on the same playing field. Paul is going to say, there was a certain way you used to act when you were like them and with them and in the kingdom of darkness. Don't sneak, st don't sneak stuff into the kingdom of light. Listen, it happens. I'm not shaming anyone. The last trip my family went on, we went to Mexico. 
You go through, and there's some stress getting into Mexico. You, you fly in, and all of a sudden, you've got to go through customs, and you don't really understand the language. You're standing in line, and you've got all kinds of signs about what you can't bring in. And then you've got drug dogs, which is tr- triggering for some of us. You've got the big German shepherd, and you've got the drug dogs walking around. I'm like, this is okay. <sighs> I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm fine. Took my whole family through. Sure enough, that drug dog comes walking around. <laughs> And it sat down at my son's bag. And I know enough to know that's not good. And Brooke and I get eye contact. We're like, this is not good. And you got all these thoughts running through your head. Somebody snuck drugs into my kid's bag. Or I failed as a parent. My kid is... (laughs) My son's here. I didn't think that for long. Sorry, bro. I didn't think that for long. But you run through all this stuff, and then you're like, what do I do? They take my kid. I haven't memorized taken in Spanish yet. I don't have that in my, all I know is beat you like a piñata, and that's not, that doesn't translate. Sure enough, they open my son's bag, and we're, I'm sweating. I'm like, I don't know what to do right here. Do you know what it was? My son, at the behest and request of his mom, snuck a banana into Mexico. And apparently you cannot sneak bananas into Mexico. My son got busted for being a banana bandit. He was sneaking bananas into Mexico and it made no sense to me. I'm thinking, why? Oh, so I can bring fentanyl in? Any kind of opio, just not a banana. I actually had to study it. Do you know that on the banana, Mexico fights against what is called the banana rust thrip? This rust thrip, it's tiny, you can't even see it with your eyes. It's like a no seum, but it'll multiply and replicate and it can ruin entire crops. What Paul is saying here is, hey, you used to be part of the kingdom of darkness, I get it. It impacted how you thought, felt, believed, and behaved. You're now in the kingdom of light um, and you brought some thrips with you. And we're going to have to look at how to remove those thrips because those thrips, how many of you know you've got issues, you've got character issues, you've got thrips that you have carried for years and they literally ruin some of the fruit of the spirit in your life. You know you have them and you can just say, yeah, it's immaturity. We, we all owned it last week. We have immaturity. I've got so many thrips. I've only got 14 minutes left. It's, I don't even have enough time to name my thrips to you. And Jesus realizes that and says, I justified you, I paid for you, and now I'm gonna sanctify you and deal with the thrips. And he wants to tell us how to deal with the thrips. Number one, you banana bandits, what did you sneak through customs? What thrips are you carrying? You gotta be honest about that because if you say I don't have any thrips, you're not gonna seek to mature. You're not actually dealing with reality. So number one, what did you sneak through customs? You're not like them, you're in the... You're in the kingdom of light. Now watch number two. How do we actually change then? How does change take place? That You know, denominationally we're split on this. The church in America is split on this. Do you know we have 2,000 denominations in Protestant evangelicalism and we'll split on this. Some people say, you want to change? Let go and let God. See, striving and know that he's God. Rest in him, Matthew 11, 28. Abide in him, John 15. Let him change you. So many of us are like, God, change me. I did that for years. I can't, I can't stop drinking Jack. Change me. I'm waiting for you to change me. That's the cease striving, stop, and abide camp. There's a whole other camp that says, discipline yourself for the sake of righteousness. It's about self-will. You press on to lay hold of that for which God laid hold of you. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You do it. Do it. Go. The church doesn't even agree on this in America. Do you realize that? Watch what Paul does with this. Before we get into it, you're going to see two different camps. You're going to see the stop it camp. If you want to change, you just have to stop it. Some of you grew up in stop it churches. Don't, right? Every week you came and you heard about what you don't supposed to do. Don't do it, stop it. Others of you grew up in start it churches. Do more, do more, do more. Now, you all said you had ridden bikes. This is actually a medical device. It says it right there, medical device. You put it under your desk and you pedal. 
This is going to explain everything that Paul's talking about. Watch, I'm going to go, I'm going to go verse, this is 22, 23, and 24, but I'm going to go verse 22 and then 24. I'm going to show you two pedals, and then in 23, I'm going to show you the bridge, the principle that makes these two pedals work. You ready? Change is as easy as riding a bike, but was riding a bike ever really easy for you when you started? See, it takes between 16 and 45 days to learn. Most of us just remember that moment where we learned and it was exciting. We don't remember the 16 to 45 days that it took us to learn. In Christianity, many of us have never learned to ride a bike. We're using one pedal or the other. But when you use one pedal or the other, you don't gain momentum and move forward. Watch, let's look at pedal number one, 22. Here's pedal number one. That in reference to your former manner of life, how you used to walk in the kingdom of darkness, you were in college, you partied, it was all about you, sensuality. But in reference to that manner of life, you take off or lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. So part of change is stop it, right? Is it good to stop sinning? Yes, it's not a trick question. The wages of sin is death. Sin will kill you, it's not good. So he says, take off the old, that's one pedal. That you literally name the thrip and say, this thrip is killing other fruit in my life and I need to stop it, to quit it, knock it off. Don't. But, quick caution for those of you who grew up in stop it churches. Um, If you go through your life just stopping it, laying aside and quitting, you need to be very careful because science teaches us when you remove something, you stop something, you quit something, if you don't add something, you've just created a vacuum and guess what happens in a vacuum? It gets filled with something. Jesus told an interesting story about this in Luke chapter 11 where he casts out a demon. The man did not put his faith in Christ, was not filled, and a whole bunch more came back and it was worse. This is why many of you, you grew up in stop at churches and you're trying to stop it. You're trying to get momentum. You can't get momentum. Why? Because your life is actually worse off now than it was before because all of the stop it, stop it, stop it has led to this legalism where it's all about you and you're very bitter and angry and sour. You ever been around a bitter, angry, sour Christian that tells everybody else, I stopped it, you need to stop it. In AA, we call it white knuckling. I'm done, you should be done. You're a dry drunk, right? You're, you're using half of the pedal. Now, again, is it good to stop sinning? Yes. Is it the whole answer? Stop it. No, if if it was the whole answer, we would no longer have a drug problem in America. Do you remember Nancy Reagan, 1980? Just say, we spent billions on that one, billions. I remember we had bumper stickers, just say no. Brilliant, I was in rehab. I just need to say no. Why didn't I think of that? Because sin creates slaves. You can't just say no. You're a a slave to sin. Just saying no is half the answer, but you can't get the full rotation to get momentum. And you're actually gonna, it's gonna drive you insane. So now he gives you the other half of the equation. Look at verse 24, pull up verse 24. Not only just say no, but you put on what? The new man, the new self, the new set of thoughts and beliefs and behaviors. So all of a sudden, you take off the old and say, those things are banana thrips. They're killing the crop of the fruit of righteousness. But you don't just take off and say no. You begin to put on in its place righteousness and goodness. Now all of a sudden, when you begin to stop and start, guess what happens? Yeah, in physics we call it that that force that transfers that creates momentum. You begin to move forward. Now it's janky as a kid when you start out trying to ride a bike 
you're going to fall a few times. My kids fell dozens of times. I asked my son what he, what he remembered about learning to ride a bike. He was like, I was just afraid to move forward because I knew I was going to crash and I was pain averse. This is my son, super mature. I was pain averse, so I didn't want to go too fast and try too hard because I knew I was going to fall. You should see him ride a bike now. It's astounding. You see, it takes practice to take off the old, put on the new. But when you do, it's just like a bicycle. When you do, a, and you're using both pedals, a principle begins to take over. It's a mystery. In, in physics, it, it's this mystery, this principle of the gyroscopic effect, the caster effect. It's invisible. But when you begin going, physics can't fully explain how a bike stays upright. We just can't. Honest physicists will say, we don't know. We can put a man on the moon, but we can't figure out exactly why a bike stays upright. If you take a bike and roll it fast enough, even without a human being, it'll stay upright. Why? Well, they think maybe the gyroscopic principle takes over that that forward momentum uh, keeps the bike from going one way or the other. Do you know in Christianity when you begin to stop what needs to stop and start what needs to start, a principle takes over that Paul outlines in verse 23. Watch verse 23. And that you, this is in the passive voice, it's what God does to you. You take off, you put on, that's an active, that's an active verb in the aorist tense, uh, point action, one time in the past, it continues to have results, but that's a verb we have to do. So if you're back here just saying, I'm a stop it guy, God changed me. He says, actually, I co-labor with you. I need you to do something in this. Take off and put on. But God, that feels like I have to work. Yeah, but then I work. I begin to renew you and transform you. And he says the spirit of the mind. He's gonna, as you're taking off and putting on, he actually changes, I would have translated this, the attitude of your mind. So as I'm taking off saying, okay, Lord, I got to quit drinking and I'm being filled with the spirit and putting on righteousness and holiness and godliness and love and joy and, and I'm taking off and putting on and I begin to pedal. I'm a year into recovery and all of a sudden he begins to change my, the attitude of my mind. You see, children are funny. As we grow in Christ, we will look at stuff that's horrible and we'll think it's delightful. You ever seen a kid? I, I had kids who used to eat out of the trash can. Anybody? So it was just me. Okay. Um, well, I won't talk about my kids that are here. I'll talk about me. Uh, in the Tooker house growing up in Gold Beach, Oregon, um, gum got banned. We weren't good with gum. We left, it was three boys. We left gum everywhere. We put gum in each other's hair. I'd get gum in my hair. So mom and dad, rightfully so, because we weren't mature enough, banned all gum in the house. So the Tooker boys learned, hey, people spit gum out, and there's treasures all over the trails. There, there's sidewalk suites that are, as of yet, undiscovered. So we would go on Saturdays. Yeah, don't act like you guys didn't do it. I'm feeling the contempt and disgust. So we would go literally find sidewalk suites, treasures on the trail. We would find leftover gum. We would peel it up. Some of it even had flavor. Those were the best ones. You'd find fresh, fresh gum roadkill. <laughs> See, as children, we look at things and think, that's delightful. Oh, that is delightful. I'm not breaking the law because I'm not buying gum, but I'm still getting my gum. This is why Paul says, when I was a child, I used to think like a child, reason like a child, and act like a child. Many of us have those things in our life. We, have, we still associate in our mind. The attitude of our minds, the spirit of our mind is, that gum on the sidewalk is good. It's delightful. And we carry that belief, that thought, and that behavior through customs into our life in Christ. Paul says, what are you, why are you doing that? And as you begin to take it off, it feels like loss and loss is pain. You're like, I can't eat gum off the sidewalk anymore. This is what kids do. I would say that is good, but broccoli, fresh bro broccoli, mom, ugh. 
you would call sidewalk sweets icky, but broccoli, no, you, you get it. You get what I'm saying? Kids' minds are messed up. Paul is saying when you begin to take off and put on, the spiritual principle takes over where he literally changes the attitude of your mind and you say, oh my goodness, I've been eating gum off the sidewalk and that is disgusting. When God has prepared this perfect, beautiful meal for me and he wants to transform me and you'll find something happening, the more momentum you get, he shows up and he allows you to see things different. You know we all have these attitudes of our mind. We attach value to things that aren't valuable. This is why they have entire websites dedicated to preachers in sneakers where we find our identity, and I get it. Growing up, all I wanted was a pair of Air Jordans. Did I want them because I played basketball? No. I told you, I couldn't dribble, I couldn't pass, I couldn't shoot. I was the mascot for the team. I wanted a pair of Air Jordans because they meant I would be accepted. I would be, I would matter. People would look at me with coveting envy. And I have found in my life, even as I grow up, the clothes oftentimes that I want to pick, it's not about Lululemon. It's about the fact that people will see the little mark. Because they, they hide it, so you kind of got to show it, right? And people will think, oh, he's somebody. He measures up. It's why oftentimes we drive what we drive and we live where we live and we look the way we look because the attitude of our mind is if I just have the approval of people, I'm somebody. God says, no, actually, it's only in Christ. And when you begin to take off and to put on that principle of takeover, 11 seconds left, let's land the plane with this. I'm gonna go 25 to 32. Now he just gives us the thrips. We're gonna start thrip thrashing. Once you start taking off and putting on, you're gonna get some momentum. It's super duper fun. He doesn't just tell you, quit it, stop it, knock it off, because that'll lead to legalism. You'll look like the church lady off of SNL. And he doesn't just say, start it, do more, um, because if you do that, you're gonna be a hypocrite. If you just put on without taking off, you're just covering up your sin with more Bible studies, more activity. But if you just take off without putting on, it's totally a mess, you're legalistic. So Paul says, no, let's do both. Let's thrip thrash. So let's thrip thrash together. Watch this. Here's what we're gonna take off. Therefore, putting away, join me on this ride. I'm making a fool out of myself to get the gospel to join me on the ride. Would you, let's do this together. Get on your bike. We're thrip thrashing, we're taking off. Therefore, putting away. False. Now, if you just stop lying, that's what falsehood is. Anybody here ever lie? Hmm? Let's just own it. So a whole bunch of you have never, ever lied, and I think I just invited you into your first lie then. Mm-hmm. Got you. So uh, a liar that says, I'm no longer going to lie, it's just a liar in between lies. It's just that the next opportunity to lie hasn't come up yet. I'm not going to lie right now. Well, that's good. But if you don't replace it with something, you're not thrip thrashing. Therefore, uh, putting away falsehood, well, what are we going to replace it with? Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. So you want to grow? You want your character to change? Lord Jesus, I don't want to lie anymore. I don't know why I lie. Sometimes I just lie. Well, we lie because we want other people to think more of us than we actually are. We want other people to admire us. So we lie. He says, don't lie. Be honest with each other. Hi, my name's Dave. I'm an epic mess. I'm surprised that I remembered to breathe last night. It's that bad. I'm surprised I'm still alive. But praise God, he's not done with me. He's still working. Speak the truth. That's called vulnerability, openness, honesty, and it builds a community. Next, next thrip to thrash. Go 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, 27, and and give no opportunity to the devil. So there are things to be angry about, amen? You should be angry. There's trafficking going on. There's an epidemic of drugs in America. Our kids are being utterly groomed. There's things I get angry about. 
I get fired up. Sometimes I get so angry, I cry. And ends up, the Bible says, be angry. But really, be really careful with it because anger can be radioactive. So he says, be angry, but don't sin and don't go to bed angry. This is, he just quotes Psalm 4.4 here. Be angry, but lay down on your bed and meditate and be still before God. Be angry, but don't sin means that you take that anger and you give it to Jesus and say, I'm not the one who's going to make everything right in this world. Yes, is trafficking horrific? Yes, is, is the drug epidemic horrific? Yes, is the grooming of our children, what Disney and all, all that's going on, is this horrific? Yes, and I don't have the power to change it. So what do I do? I take that anger and I don't give it its own room in my heart because that anger is like gremlins that spread. You ever seen the movie Gremlins, 1980? It's bad. They, they spread just a little water, pop, 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 pop. You got gremlins, everybody. Some of you got gremlins all over inside of you. You're angry. I see it on your face. You're so angry. You don't even understand why. You've been going to bed with anger and it's reproduced and replicated. You can't change the world by yourself. Jesus is coming back and ends up, he's gonna tread the wine press of the fierce wrath of the almighty God so you can go to bed and say, praise God. He's coming back, he's gonna make it right. Gotta end. Uh, go 28, 29, 30 through on 32, jump through. You can look at it. There's take off, take on, there's more thrips. Why can we change? We can change because we can walk in the light. Because of the gospel, we can admit, there is stuff I snuck into the kingdom. I snuck it through customs. I didn't even know it was bad. I just snuck those, I'm a banana bandit. I snuck it in. But you can say, I know now how change happens. The spirit of God has come to dwell in me. I'm gonna take off what needs to be taken off. I'm gonna put on what needs to be put on. And that principle is going to take over and Jesus is going to change the attitude of my mind. And because of that, my character is going to grow one day at a time as I take off and put on. And I can do this because the gospel, you understand in the gospel, Jesus took off. Do you know he took something off? And do you know he put something on? He was the original one who did this. But in the gospel, it's the mere opposite. He took off his splendor he left, he left heaven and took off his splendor. He took off all of his glory and came to earth and he put on my sin. Your sin, he who knew no sin. He took off his splendor and put on our sin. Why? So I can, I can take off my sin and put it on him. And I can pick up his splendor, his righteousness and glory and put it on me. And when that love sloshes around in your heart, you'll begin to take off the old man and put on the new man and allow that principle of transformation to take over. And your character will grow more and more like Christ. That's what we celebrate at communion. Let me pray as Ralph comes up and leads us in communion and we celebrate the one that laid aside his splendor took on our sin so that we might lay down our sin and pick up his splendor by grace. Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son. Jesus, thank you. I can't grasp it, but thank you for laying aside your splendor. Thank you for coming to earth as the Lamb of God to take on our sin so that we might take off our sin and put it on you and have it be paid for and put on your splendor. And so I pray as we celebrate and remember what you did to help mature and grow us, as you said, this is my body, this is my blood. Would you allow us to see the deep love that you have for us? Would you allow that blood shed abroad, that love shed abroad in our hearts to fill us with your love that we might change and look more like you, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Uh, My name is Ralph, I serve on the elder team here at Hillside and it's uh, my pleasure to lead us in observance of the Lord's Supper uh, this morning. You don't have to be a member of Hillside to participate. If you have accepted 
Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are more than welcome to join us. <clears throat> and I also welcome uh, those that are watching online this morning. Uh, you are uh, welcome to, to gather your elements together in your homes and uh, participate with us as well. Let's see, the elements themselves are in this little cup this morning. If you would like to participate with us this morning and haven't uh, picked one of these up on your way in, just raise your hand and keep it up. We've got um, <clears throat> ushers uh, around the building that will come by and uh, uh, get you taken care of. <clears throat> These little plastic cups are pretty neat. Uh, the bottom has uh, a little tab that will give you access to uh, the wafer. And if I've gotten the habit of just going ahead and opening that and taking the, the uh, wafer out just so it's handy. And then the other end obviously has the tab for uh, access to the, to the juice. My time here with you this morning is not just to uh, guide us through the taking of the, the wafer and the juice, <clears throat> but to hopefully connect a little bit with what Dave's message uh, was rooted in uh, with the actual act of celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> the elder team probably a couple of years ago talked about <clears throat> how we could better connect as we uh, led communion with what he was uh, giving as his primary message uh, during his sermon time. And out of that uh, came uh, an increased communication, I guess, with Dave as uh, sharing with us uh, the passages that he would be covering each week and give us a chance then to sort of share with you and connect uh, with what Dave has said that had meaning relative to uh, uh, the Lord's Supper. So as I spoke with Dave about what, uh, you know, how best could I connect with what he was gonna share, he said, well, it's, um, what I'm sharing is basically about the old man and putting that off and uh, putting the new man on. And I said, okay, I think I can work with that. And very quickly, I, I can't explain why, my mind took me back to uh, my early childhood days. And I'll share a little bit of my connection with putting off the old and putting on the new man in my life. Uh, I grew up in a small farm uh, in central Texas uh, we didn't have a lot, but we always seemed to have enough. One of my vivid memories is on our back porch, uh, mom had her washing machine, and it didn't look a lot like what washing machines look like today. It was basically a tub, and I think it may have had... Um, a, a middle part in it that, that spun. Uh, but it also had two rollers attached to it uh, that were um, an opportunity to take the clothes after they had been washed, put them through this ringer, I think it was called, and it squeezed the excess water out and then the clothes were ready to put in the basket and then take out uh, to the clothesline and hang them up to dry. And I have a vivid memory about blue jeans uh, being washed. And not so much that they were washed, but she put starch in them uh, during that, that washing process. And then before they were hung out on the line to dry, she had these long metal rods, I think they were called stays or staves, that she pushed down each of the legs of the jeans and then would hang them up on the clothesline so they would dry in the sun. That was all well and good until you had to put those jeans on. 
They were extremely stiff, uh, very scratchy, and even I remember after wearing them for you know a year or so, you, you, they were hard to bend, so they wore at the knees, and then she would iron a cotton picking patch on top of it. And when she bought me new jeans, she usually bought them about six inches too long. And so you had to roll them up for the first year or two until you grew into the full length of those jeans. But mostly I just recall the stiffness of those things. It was hard to sit down with how stiff those jeans were. What does that have to do with putting off the old man and putting on the new. Just to give you an insight into my relationship with Christ and growth in that, I was born with an old starched heart. Being good was the antidote to being bad. Somehow it was supposed to all balance out in the end. Thanks to Bible study and faithful friends, Jesus took my stiff, starched heart and gave me a new, pliable heart. Not a repaired or refurbished heart, but I believe a completely new heart. Sadly, I occasionally still try to starch my new heart. I get frustrated. I get angry at times, I hide, and I think I'm in control a lot of the times. But thanks be to God that he provides me a rent cycle that overcomes my selfish efforts. That rent cycle is called forgiveness. The wonder-working power of his Holy Spirit cleans me up time and again. He offers us an opportunity this morning to go through this rent cycle and experience newness in him. Please join with me as we allow him to clean us up as we submit our hearts to his spirit in the observance of the Lord's Supper. In preparing to do that, uh, <clears throat> we have traditionally used 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verses 27 through 29, it outlines our uh, perspective on getting prepared to take the elements. He writes, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts uh, for taking of the elements, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take, uh, partake of those together. So just take a, a minute or so and go before the Lord. Thank you. Chapter 11 in uh, 1 Corinthians also includes in verses 23 to 26, uh, the guidance on actually taking the elements. I will read, read those for us. For I've received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, 
This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you all. Would you all mind standing? And we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer together. And then our uh, praise team will will close out the, the worship service this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all.